Jessica Franchuk. I'm an editor of, of or with Shield Wall Media. Um, on behalf of Well Forming Magazine and all of us at Shield Wall Media, I'd like to welcome you to the show, which is the last day of the show, but still welcome. Uh, we're offering educational classes or programs, and we're also launching a construction role forming association as an effort to encourage best practices and grow a safe and profitable industry. I'd like to introduce Josh Beck with Beck Automation, and he'll be presenting on pre cut versus post cut panels. And this is Josh with, so I'm with the Bradbury Group. Uh, Never uh, mind. That's fine. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, so I do. Panel lines, trim, purlins, studs. Are any of you guys currently roll for me? You guys are rolling. You guys have a pre cut or a post cut line? Mm. Post. You don't have any roll for me currently? Okay. Um, do you want to do this? Yeah, no worries. Um, are any of you guys looking to purchase a roll former in the next six months? Okay. And then, do any of you have an idea of whether you would want to do pre or post? Do you have kind of a general idea of the benefits of either? Uh, a little bit. A little bit? Okay. So next would be who has no clue of the post. Okay. So I'll kind of start with a general overview of a pre-cut and a post-cut, yeah, and then kind of get a little more detail as we go along. So pre-cut, the panel is going to be cut to length before it's roll formed. So you'll generally have a, you know, always have a decoiler, a pre-cut shear with a feeder in it. Um, usually you're going to be a conveyor, not on every single line. These will be between 10 and 13 feet. Some people have up to a 40 foot. And then the And then on a post cut line, you're going to have a profile shear blade. So whatever panel you're running, you're going to need a shear that's going to be the exact shape of your panel, so that way you can minimize your burr and you're not going to crunch any majors or minor rips. So you'll just have the decoiler and the roll former unit because the infeed guide tooling and shears almost always be on the same. Base. Uh, so, pre-cut pros, this pro is going to be for if you are wanting to, you don't have any metal building equipment and you want to get all the equipment needed to run your panels, your flat sheets, and your trim while minimizing your initial investment. With a pre-cut line, you can turn your conveyor and the roll former on to run your panels. And then you can turn your conveyor and the roll former off and use that pre-cut shear just to cut flat sheets onto your conveyor. And then nowadays a lot of manufacturers will offer a optional slitter feature. So that way you can run your panels, cut your flat sheets, and slip them down all using one line. So you just need to purchase a folder to actually break the trip. And then what comes with that, if that's what you're looking to do, is that it will be less space. So you won't need separate slip cut plane lines to do that. Spore pros is that you're gonna have longer time between shear blade sharpening. So in a pre-cut shear, you have a flat shear. So when one side gets dull, you can just rotate the blades. Whereas on a post-cut line, if it's profiled, you just have that one cutting edge. So whenever that's dull, you have to ship it in to go either to a machine shop or to your equipment manufacturer to get it sharpened. So one, the cutting edge on a profile shear and one cutting edge on a pre-cut shear, neither of them should dull any quicker than the other one. But when a post-cut line is dull, you can't use it. When a pre-cut line is dull, you just rotate it. Um, and then pre-cut also provides the most economical option available. If that's what you're looking for, which would be feeding in flat sheets, which is usually going to be for trim roll formers. But if you wanted to do it with panels, there's guys out there doing it. Uh, it's just the, if you're using ag panel, for example, you got a 41 inch wide coil. You'll need as long of a flat sheet as panel that you want to run. So it just becomes a headache to manage the store, and, and whoever's running is going to have a headache. Um, some cons about pre-cut. So the one con is going to be end flare. So 
So if you're not familiar with the end flare, steel has a spring back. So after you fold it or bend it, it's gonna it wants to go back to wherever it was just at. So every time it runs through a pass, it's going to spring back just a little bit to where it was before the pass. Um, so on a example for a folder, if you want to bend it to 90 degrees, the folder will always bend it a little further, knowing it's going to spring back to its location. Same with the roll former every time it goes through a pass. So you'll want to talk to your equipment manufacturer about how much flare they allow and how far in. Uh, typically, the rule of thumb is that after about a foot, it's completely back to, if you're running an accidental 36 inch coverage, um, and then it's kind of tapered out as it goes to the leading and trailing edge. So the only thing that stops spring back is going to be the panel holding it, or anything holding it where it is, which is in the middle of the panel. It's going to be each side of whatever point that you're measuring, and it's going to be the panel itself holding it there. So on the end, you won't have that. So how far out do you get? I mean, when we're talking about that on the flare, like right at the end, is that? I mean, do you measure that in degrees or thousands or what are you? In inches. So okay. if you have an ag panel, yeah. you'll want 36 inch coverage. Right. <coughs> so you have to be how far out. Well, if you're if you're a foot back, you're going to measure 36. But if you're right on the edge, what would you measure? How wide is that? Is that a? So it's going to vary. You'll, you'll want to talk to your equipment manufacturer about what they allow, because in their quote they'll spec how much you can expect your panel to flare out before it's too far and it's out of tolerance. Um, but they will have some sort of value, whether it's a 32nd, a 16th, or an 8th, it's just going to depend on who you're looking for. Uh, the second con would be using your shear and panels for flat sheet can become a con whenever you, the combined time that you need to run your panels or your flat sheet to split is going to be more than eight hours. Either you're going to have to uh, add a shift, you're going to have to increase your lead time, or you're going to buy a separate slip type length line, which is a good headache to have because you have you have enough jobs to justify the need to separate your panels from your split line. Um, but until you have that split line, it's still a headache that you're going to have to manage regardless. And a, another thing that comes with it is if you are looking to get all of the metal building equipment to your trims and panels while minimizing your initial investment, it's a cost effective way to do a pre cut, but it's not very time efficient. So if you use an ag panel, for an example, what a lot of guys will do is 29 gauge 80 KSI for their panels, but then they'll do 50 KSI 29 gauge for their trim. So if someone has an all ruby red building, they need ruby red panels and ruby red trim, you don't just run your panels and then stop your roll form and run your flashes off the same coil. Usually, you will have to take that coil off and put on the other tensile strength one, so it's going to be a whole lot of coil change. And then the next con, it's not the end all be all, but it's at least something to mention. On a pre cut line, you're going to have more moving parts to maintain. On a post cut line, you got the decoiler, span and contract motor, and the drive motor. Sometimes they're the same motor, sometimes they're different. You want to talk to whoever you are dealing with about equipment. Um, and then the drive motor for the roll former and the shear motor. We're on a pre cut line, you're going to have those decoiler motors, the feeder motor shear motor, and bear motor, usually an overriding clutch for your feeder, and then the roll form motor. So there's just more items that you're going to want to look after to make sure that it's everything's in good condition. And then the main con that you're going to run in for the most part, no matter who you are, where you are in the country, is going to be minimum part length. So it's I don't want to say on 100% of pre-cut lines, but usually the minimum part is going to be three feet panel on a pre-cut line. So here we have a manual shear and an automatic shear. So if you have to run anything under three feet, then you're going to have to take it to a side shear to cut them down. Um, so the cons that come with that is going to be the cost of machinery. These aren't going to be $100,000, but it's definitely something you'll want to factor into your budget and then time and labor. Where that comes in, let's say that you need 52 footers. 
then you'll have to run panels and take them over to the side shear to cut them down. Now what we do is we use a back automation controller, so that will actually will run out, if you need 52 footers, you'll punch it in, and it'll run 25 four footers for you. So then you'll take those 25 four footers over to the side shear, cut them down, but for each panel, you're going to have to put it in there to make sure it's the exact length that you want, so it's an accurate part, and then make sure it's square so it's a good cut. So if you have to do that 25 times to get 52 footers, say it takes 15 to 20 minutes, on a post cut line, it's going to take you three minutes. So you have the longer time to run the job, but then you also have the opportunity cost of whoever is taking those panels over to cut them down. If it's the guy who's running the panel line, well, the panel line is not running for that 15 minutes that he's over there cutting them down. So that day, 15 minutes might not be mean much, but if you do it 15 minutes every work day of the year, it can start to add up to multiple shifts. Uh, post cut pros. So the post cut line is going to be virtually zero flare on any panel at any place on the panel. The reason for that is on a post cut line you're pretty much just running one long panel. So every leading and trailing edge of every panel was the middle of that panel before you sheared it. Um, so once you shear the panel, it's already overcame that spring back. So once you shear it, it's not going to want to move back to where it was. It's already at 36 inches. So where you are going to get flare is on the very first leading edge of the first panel and a trailing edge of your very last panel. How, how far in? About how far in do you think that will? The end I mean, flare? If you, cut, if you cut like two feet off or... If you, so you're saying how do you just get rid of the yeah. flare you would use to? The rule of thumb is about a foot. Okay, so it takes in about a foot. Usually, yeah. It'll, let's say that your flare that you're going to get is going to be a sixteenth of an inch. Then it'll be a sixteenth at the end and then it will flare, mm -hmm. right? It will taper into zero. So the best way would be to talk to the equipment manufacturer, but then also just run on a panel and see exactly where it stops. Because then you're still going to have to zero your encoder and your shear. So whenever you run it out, you can just run out you know, one foot instead of a couple inches, shear it, and then you won't have any flare. And then the no minimum part length. So I don't want to go into a big spiel about why it's a pro for post cut, because it's pretty much going to be the exact opposite of why it's a con for pre cut. You're just going to save, you're not going to buy a side shear, and then you are also going to save all of that time that you would be spending cutting panels down. Uh, pro for a post cut is if you have your panel line and your slip cut length line as separate lines, then it's going to require less floor space for a post cut line because you're not going to need that conveyor. So usually, or a lot of times it's just going to be 10 foot, but it can be 20, 30, 40 foot conveyor, which I know square footage is not always cheap nowadays. So. For some, that's important in the shop to have more space for storage or to do any other line or what have you. And then the next one is going to be less tooling wear. So one of the major factors in tooling wear is going to be the leading edge hitting the panel or hitting the tooling. So every time you run a panel through, it's going to be hitting that tooling at whatever speed you're running. So if you're running 200 feet per minute and you're running 50 panels, every single pass is going to be hit at 200 feet per minute 50 times. On a post cut line, if it's one long panel, once you run that first panel all the way through, then it doesn't get hit by a single leading edge until you run your next job. Are you talking about uh, flying post cut or just a stationary post cut? So I'll get to the flying post cut, but it's going to be universal either way. They're still just going to be the one leading edge when you speed it up. And also, usually on a post cut line, whenever, whenever guys speed it up, they usually jog it rather than run it. So that one leading edge that's hitting on the tooling still might only hit that 40 feet per minute rather than 200. So some post cut cons. Some panels are going to be more difficult to run with a profile shear blade, so you have to use a slug shear. This is going to be, happens sometimes on some more intricate wall panels, but it's usually going to be on standing seam. Some of those snap lock and seam together. The rims can be pretty thin and pretty intricate to where maybe it won't sometimes I don't want to get caught on the shear. 
So what you'll use is a slump shear. So what that is is whenever the top shear comes down, it will punch out the width of that shear in the panel. So it's not going to crunch any ribs. It doesn't create any more <coughs> than any other shear. Works perfectly fine. The con is that you're going to have scrap. So every single time that you fire that shear, the width of your shear blade you're going to have is scrap. So if you have a quarter inch shear blade, then every time you shear you have a quarter inch of scrap. But if you have a one inch wide shear blade, you're going to have an inch every time you fire the shear. So over the length of that line, it's going to add up eventually. And then only one cutting edge for the shear blade. So if this is profiled, you can only cut using this one edge. Um, whereas on a pre-cut, you have multiple edges because they're all going to be flat, so you can just rotate them. So you're typically going to want to do two things. Either one, buy a second set of shear blades, which will then have to be factored into your decision or your budget. Or you will have to plan to be down for a day or a half day to send in your shear blades to a machine shop or to your equipment manufacturer to sharpen them for you. Um, so this post-cut con is going to be that it requires more equipment to cut flat sheets. So if you are wanting to get all the equipment you need for panels and trim and try to minimize that initial investment, post-cut is going to be a little more expensive for you. So this is going to be the cheapest route on post-cut line, which would be a feeder with a blind, uh, flat shear above the end feed guide. Um, so right here is going to be a feeder shear. And here is going to be a pallet over the green line, which is the guards. So you'll feed the coil in top, um, cut your flat sheets right over the guards onto a pallet. So it's going to be a little more expensive than a pre-cut way to do all of that because now you have a post-cut shear with a post-cut motor that you're not going to have on a pre-cut line. So instead of just one shear, one motor, you're going to have two this route. The second option you can do is by use one decoiler and feeding one way into a panel line and then whenever you're done running your panels then you would feed a coil into the other direction into a feeder shear unit. So it's going to be more expensive to do number two than number one or than a pre-cut line um, if you hit it. But it's going to be the cheapest and easiest route to number three. So number three is separating your panels from your trim, which is where you'll want to be eventually because that would mean that you have enough jobs to justify separating your trim line from your panels. Um, so if minimizing that initial investment is the most important and the pre-cut is going to be the best followed by number one here, but then number two is going to offer the best route to number three which is where you want to be eventually. The post-cut myth is that post-cut results in far more scrap. This is not true. A lot of guys think that whenever you're done running your job, that everything left in the machine is scrap. So you have a 25, 35 feet of steel that you can't use. Uh, most, almost all post-cut manufacturers will have a solution to this. What Bradbury's is, is we have these shears up front, which are, we call them smart cut slitter shear. So as you're running your job, when that trailing edge of your last panel gets up to the shear, the line is going to stop, the control will say, hey, go pull your smart cut slitter, walk to the front, pull it, start the line up again, and then whenever that last inch of panel in the line gets out, that will be the trailing edge of your very last panel. So the only scrap you should have on a post cut line or pre cut line will be whenever you're feeding your, your coil up and then zeroing your shear. So uh, post cut and pre cut you should get exactly the same scrap. And then you click it again to play. So this is going to be, I'm going to compare kind of a stop to cut versus a flying. This is going to be a feed to stop pre cut unit. So it runs it out, stops, shears it. <coughs> um, so then this would be a flying shear on a pre-cut. So the, if your maximum chilling speed on your roll form is going to be 200 feet per minute, the rule of thumb on a feed to stop is that you're going to get about 6 20-foot panels a minute. 
about 120 feet of steel if you're running 20 foot panels. And then on a, if you're using that same roll form at 200 feet per minute, then the flying shear will get you 200 feet of actual steel every minute. Um, so almost doubling your throughput. You can play it again and it'll keep going. Or can you go back? You click on the, the click it again and it'll play again. Um, then what's nice about this is if you have a single level or a dual level, how you feed each level is going to be just bring the conveyor up or down. So the investment to go from a stop to cut to a flying on a single level or a dual level is going to be the same investment because you still just have the one flat shear that feeds on the conveyor and the roll former or the shear doesn't care whether it's single level or dual level, it just feeds flat sheets. So it would be the same investment whether it's a single level or a dual level, uh, which is nice. Stop cut, post cut line. Here, there's a, also a drop table. So runs it out, stops, shears it, drops a couple of the stack it below, and then starts running the next one. With a flying shear on a post cut line, typically that shear is going to be flown on belts, and that shear has to catch up to the exact speed and match the speed the panel is running out, and shear it while it's moving and get home. So that way you're going to minimize burr, you're not going to crunch any ribs, you're going to make a great cut and it's going to be the exact length that you want. Um, so matching that speed is really important. It's also important that it gets all the way back home so that way it zeroes its shear or else whenever it fires again it may miss its location. So on a pre-cut line, if you're on 200 feet per minute, the shear can usually go all the way down to a three foot panel or at 200 feet per minute. On a post cut line flying shear, you can still do any minimum part length that you want, but as you get to shorter lengths, you're typically gonna have to slow down your line. Cutting two feet parts at 200 feet per minute is not gonna be easy for anyone to make that shear do that. So this is gonna be the Hage flying shear. This can do 200 feet per minute down to six foot parts. And then as you get shorter than that, then it's going to, or shorter than that, it's going to have to go slower and slower the line, and it's all formulas for it. So it'll tell you at what length, what speed you can run max at. Is anybody interested in stud or perlin lines? Okay, I'll go over this. The main question that you want to ask yourself with a stud and a perlin line is going to be what kind of tolerance you need for your part. Because on a post cut line, the pros don't outweigh the cons, and unless that degree tolerance is important, you can't have any flare anywhere. Uh, so I combined stud and purlin because they have pretty much overlap pros and cons on pre and post. Different lines, different parts, different industries, but um, they're close enough to where they all have the same pros and cons. So pre cut, the pro is that you only have one die set. So it doesn't matter if you run a five inch wide base angle or you're running a 14 inch wide bullshit for a C parallel. The shear doesn't care, you just make your shear wide enough for your widest coil, and then it can cut any of them for you. The con is that you're gonna have some end flare just like any pre-cut line. Um, again, you're gonna wanna talk to your equipment manufacturer on how much <coughs> you allow, but when it comes to parallel lines, the deeper the flange and the heavier the gauge, the more it's gonna flare out. On a post-cut line, you're gonna have minimal end flare, just like on any post cut lines, it's one long per longer stud. You're going to have less tooling wear because the heavier the gauge, the harder it's going to hit that tooling. Um, and then on a light pitch drywall stud, it's almost always going to be a post cut line. So it's not really a pro, it's kind of just more of a matter of fact statement. Um, so if that's something that you're looking into, is like a drywall stud, then you can talk to the equipment manufacturer and they'll be able to tell you why they recommend a post cut versus free. Then on the cons, it's all going to revolve around the die sets. 
They're expensive, time consuming to change, and this is a typo. It's not the heavier the gauge, the heavier the die set, because the shear is the same. No matter the gauge, the larger the purlin, the heavier the die set. So a 12 inch wide C purlin is going to be a heavy die set, and it's all moved up, and it's not easy to do. And you have to have a die set for every part you're going to run. So you have to have a die set for every combination of web, flange, and lip for all of your Charlies, your Zeds, your E's, your base angle. Um, the same with stud, you need it for your track, for stud, and if you're out for planking, you need all your die sets for all your planking studs as well. And if you don't have the die set, you can't run the part. So if someone comes in for a C purlin, the dimension that you don't have the die set for, you either have to buy the die set and risk not running it again, or you just have to turn away the business and tell them that you can't run it. They'll have to go elsewhere. So this is a video of Bradbury's automatic anti-flare unit. Most equipment manufacturers will have some method of minimizing the flare. What it does is whenever the leading edge comes in, it will engage, move in, and pull that flange back to where you want it to be. Whenever it gets past the flare part, it will go back to neutral, and when the trailing edge comes, it will engage again and bring that flange back to, to where you want it. So even the one con on a pre-cut stud and proline line, you're able to minimize using an anti flare fixture. And then trim roll formers. So whenever I'm talking about pre-cut, I'm usually going to be talking about blank fed trim lines, because they're the most common, but I will go into feeding off of a coil as well. So pro, if it's a blank fed trim roll former, you only have one coil inventory. If you're running 29 gauge coils, 50 KSI for your panels, then that's all that you need for, or not for your panels, for your trim. You just need that one coil, run it through your slip cut length unit, slit it down, and feed whichever one into your trim line. And then you're also going to have minimal controls. On a blank fed, there's typically just four of them, on off, start, stop, feed out. So it's really simple. And then if you once you run off a coil, you have the option to do so. This can get expensive if you want to buy multiple trim roll formers because you have to have a decoiler and a shear for each one. And then you do have the option of rafting it. So then you can just buy one decoiler, one shear, one raft base, and then swap out all the different raft materials. And then the con for the pre cut trim roll former is that the parts are going to have flare. The trim lines, a lot of manufacturers will offer an anti twist fixture and an anti flare fixture to minimize that. If you don't have either of those, you're going to have flares that can be used for. And then post cut trim roll formers. Really, the only pro here is going to be minimal flare. So where you're going to find post cut trim roll formers mostly are going to be gutters and downspouts because they have to they have to fit into another part of it. You got to be very specific on the dimensions that they all fit together. Where if you have flare, it's not always going to work. And then the cons are going to be expensive. Each profile has to have its own shear, and each trim roll former has to have its own decoiler. Unless again it's rafted, typically what they'll do is one decoiler, one raft base, and they'll put the drive motor and the shear motor with quick disconnects, and then just swap out the raft with joining in our profile shear. And then here is going to be this is this con is also if you're going to get a pre cut trim roll former with a decoiler and shear, this is con for both, and that's you have to have coal inventory for every color and every width trim that you plan on offering. So if you plan on offering a lot of different trims, you're going to have a whole bunch of coals that you got to house. And then it's going to require additional components because you'll want an encoder and a controller to plug in your quantities and your length uh, to make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. Any questions? Can you get the post cut encoder just the same pre cut? Like with to minimize the vert? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so on, on if on you have. Panel, on your, yeah, on your panel, ag panel. Like on an ag panel line? On an ag panel line, on a post cut shear, you should have the same amount of vert as you would on a pre cut line. The reason why people may notice it more on a post cut is because typically the 
uh, but you can make a post cut line to where you reverse the blades. So the top plate is on the out on the inside, on the tooling side of the machine. So whatever it fires, it makes that burr up, and you can run them right over the panels. But with a, if you have a sharp shear that's gapped correctly, it shouldn't make any more of a burr than a pre-cut shear. Um, people just know that whenever you feel for a burr, you always feel the bottom. We're on a pre-cut line, it's going to be on the top. So as long as it's gapped correctly and it's sharp, there shouldn't be any additional burr on a post-cut than a pre-cut. Okay, my burrs are mostly on top. Not where it's flat, but mostly right on the corners on, on the top of the roof. Mm -hmm. On your on your egg panel? Yeah. Yeah. I'm about the only place to see it really. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. On your leading edge? Because if you feel the trailing edge, that burr, and it's probably going to be the same spot on the bottom. It's, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. right. So usually people will notice it more on a post because it'll be. Do you actually have that on a pre cut too? One more time. Do you actually have a burr on a pre-cut lot? Pre-cut too? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sharper the blade and the better gap, the less of a burr you're going to have. But you're always going to have some sort of burr. It just depends on how much of a burr you have. Okay. Good. Good? All right. Good job. Thanks. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for attending.